Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Alana Heckler and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Your Immune Academy webinar. We are excited to present today's topic on unanswered questions in anti-nuclear antibody testing. Following the presentation, we will open up the webinar for a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions for our speaker at any time, please type them in the chat box on your screen and we will relay them at the end of the talk. If you are interested in claiming PACE contact hours for this webinar, it is important that you log on individually and stay for the entire duration of the webinar because this will be counted as your attendance. After the webinar, you'll receive instructions via email on how to claim your PACE certificate. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Ann Tebo. Dr. Tebo is a professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and co-director of the Antibody Immunology Laboratory at Mayo Clinic Rochester. She holds a board certification in medical laboratory immunology and is a member of the Association of the Medical Laboratory Immunologists, AMLI, the Association of Diagnostics and Laboratory Medicine, ADLM, and the American College of Rheumatology, ACR. Her main research interest is in the harmonization of immunoassays for the diagnosis and management of autoimmune diseases. Through AMLI, Dr. Tebow has led two workshops aimed at improving the interpretation and reporting of ANA testing. She has authored more than 60 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and serves as a reviewer for a number of clinical and laboratory journals. Dr. Tebo, we are honored to have you here with us today to share your knowledge with us. And with that, I will hand it over to you to begin your presentation. Hello and welcome. My name is Anne Tebo, and I am a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology in Mayo Clinic. I'm also co-director of the Antibody Immunology Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I am delighted you can join me for this presentation in which I will be discussing anti-nuclear antibody testing in the clinical laboratory with highlights on certain unanswered questions. As disclosure, I would like to state that I have received a speaking fee from Euroimmune in the United States for this presentation. However, during this talk, I will not disclose any test method by name unless as required for educational content. To address certain unanswered questions in ANA testing, participants at the end of this presentation should be able to provide a contemporary definition of antinuclear antibodies and describe indications for testing, especially in the context of specific ANA-associated connective tissue diseases. Participants should also be able to describe the different methods for ANA testing, their performance characteristics, current issues affecting laboratory use and efforts which have been taken to harmonize interlaboratory performance for optimal patient evaluation. The presence of anti-nuclear antibodies is a hallmark feature of some systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases commonly referred to as ANA-associated connective tissue disease. The name antinuclear antibodies was originally described from the observation that antibodies from patients with SLE bound tissue nuclear in an, anti, an, in an indirect immunofluorescent assay. However, in addition to nuclear staining patterns, reactivity to cytoplasmic and other organelles associated with mitosis have been identified in other systemic and organ-specific autoimmune diseases. To harmonize the nomenclature reporting and interpretation of HEP2 substrate IFA, a group of experts called the International Consensus of Anti-Nuclear Antibody Pattern, ICAP, recommends the categorization of ANA HEP2 patterns as nuclear, cytoplasmic, and mitotic. Screening of ANA and or confirmation of ANA-associated antibodies are important for the evaluation of patients at risk or suspected with a connective tissue disease. Certain professional organizations may require testing for these antibodies to classify patients as having a specific connective tissue disease. For example, the positive ANA greater than or equal to 
a title of 1 to 180 or an equivalent test is an entry criterion for the 2019 American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism Classification of Systemic Lupus Erythematos. These antibodies may occur in the, over, in the absence of overt disease and may precede the onset of clinical diagnosis of connective tissue disease by many years. In addition, Anti-nuclear antibodies may occur in non-connective tissue diseases and may precede clinical onset of those diseases by many years. Two, the screening assays for anti-nuclear antibodies lack diagnostic specificity and confirmatory testing is often required to determine the type or types of autoantibodies present to guide, to guide clinical diagnosis. The recognition of well-defined anti-nuclear antibody patterns using the HEP2 cell substrate may be useful in determining the most likely autoantibodies present, as well as guide confirmatory testing and possibly help support a specific clinical diagnosis. In general, the clinical association of ANA can be stratified based on the presence or absence of connective tissue disease. While the prevalence of ANO varies based on the type of connective tissue disease, there are five main clinical subsets of ANA-associated connective tissue diseases. These include the systemic lupus erythematos, the systemic sclerosis, mixed connective tissue disease, Sjogren syndrome, and idiopathic inflammatory diseases or inflammatory myopathies. These in these diseases, the ANA occurs with varying frequency. For the non-ANA associated connective tissue diseases, it is required for the evaluation of autoimmune liver diseases such as autoimmune hepatitis and primary biliary cholangitis, and it can also be seen in some thyroid diseases, some cancers, infections, and drug-induced um, ANA is also common. In general, the frequency seems to increase with age, and this may be related to loss of tolerance as individuals age. Contemporary methods for ANA screening in the clinical laboratories can be categorized as cell-based for the traditional HER2 IFA and the solid phase immune assays based on the type of solid support or enzymatic process. Due to their ability to divide rapidly in in vitro and express large nuclei and other intracellular organelles, allowing for optimal identification of patterns and increased sensitivities, the HEP2 cells of human larynx epithelial origin have largely replaced the use of rodent tissue as substrate and in ANA testing. Increasing demands for HEP2 IFA associated with its level intensiveness and subjectivity in test interpretation, as well as declining workforce, has led to the development of alternative ANA screening, which are less subjective and can be automated uh, um, in routine clinical laboratories. These include the ELISAs, the chemilumicin-based assays, the fluoroenzyme immunoassays, the line immunoassays, the multiple bit assays, as well as others named here. Um, this figure shows um, a schematic of the HEP2 IFA, um, which includes the processing of the slides with the patient serum, um, secondary antibodies, the primary antibodies, secondary antibodies, and visualization with either a manual or digital microscope, as well as reporting of the common nuclear pat patterns. All those steps in the HEP2 IFA procedures are fraught with analytical challenges, especially with reference to the growth and expression of certain patterns, screening dilutions, nomenclature, and interpretation and reporting of patterns. There have been and there continue to be efforts to standardize the HEP2 IFA test systems. These include efforts to develop and establish autoantibody reference reagents optimal conditions for testing, interpreting, and reporting of ANA. One of the most recent international initiatives is the ICAP, which I have mentioned earlier. The ICAP was initiated to harmonize ANA IFA pattern nomenclature reporting and interpretation. It could be argued that this initiative was spurred by the 2009 ACR position statement 
on ANA testing, which was endorsed, uh, which endorsed the HEP2 IFA for ANA evaluation and was subsequently countersigned in the 2019 um, by EULA. This statement called on laboratories to state the methods used for detecting ANA amongst other requirements. In a review article which I highlighted some of the efforts by ICAP and gaps towards the overarching goal of ICAP and other initiatives, I mentioned the lack of um, training and documentation of competencies in the interpretation of certain patterns that labs are expected to report on. The ICAP recommends the staining pattern to be segregated into nuclear cytoplasmic mitotic patterns as outlined in this classification tree shown here, which was obtained, which is obtained from the NAPatterns.org, uh, maintained by the ICA committee. In accord with the Brazilian consensus strategy, the ICA further categorizes certain patterns as competent level and others as expert level reporting in this categorization. It is important to note that certain competent level patterns may not be called by some laboratories due to lack of sufficient exposure and available resources for training amongst other factors. To evaluate the interpretation and reporting of HEP2 IFA patterns based on ICAP's assessment of competencies, a survey of 16 clinical laboratory participants and eight in vitro diagnostic manufacturers for 12 sera of which seven, three, and two were qualified for nuclear cytoplasmic and mitotic patterns respectively was carried out by the Association of Medical Laboratory Immunologists in the United States. Laboratories differed in the categorization of patterns reported. Eight reporting all nuclear patterns, while three reporting only nuclear patterns, and then five reporting nuclear patterns with various combinations of cytoplasmic and mitotic patterns. For all the participants, accuracy with the intended re response for the categorical nuclear pattern was quite excellent and ranged from 95 to 100% with a mean of 99% while the cytoplasmic pattern um, really was suboptimal compared to the mitotic and nuclear pattern in this um, survey. Overall, the performance was said to be um, acceptable with higher competencies, as earlier mentioned, for the main nuclear patterns. And there was lack of harmonization in the interpretation and reporting of the cytoplasmic pattern. The inconsistency in the reporting and reporting of sub Setting sub patterns was suggested in that study to be due to kit specific expression of certain patterns, particularly for the cytoplasmic speckled pattern. In a subsequent study, which was recently published by Sylvia and colleagues, they demonstrated variability in the robustness of certain HEP2 IFA patterns across different HEP2 kits. As shown in this schematic here, um, using three SERA and two kits from um, different companies, they could show that the observation in the MLI survey um, with respect to certain cytoplasmic patterns was quite evident in that there was variation in the expression of the immunofluorescence intensity and patterns based on the different substrates, even for serum from the same source. Further stratification of the robustness of the HEP2 IFA pattern based on nuclear and cytoplasmic staining revealed pattern specific differences in immunofluorescence staining as summarized in the bar charts. Robustness was defined according to a pattern reproducibility score. For the nuclear patterns, the pattern reproducibility score ranged from excellent to poor. For the nuclear patterns, the pattern reproducibility score range from excellent to poor with the best reproducibility observed in the centromere pattern and the list for the nuclear envelope patterns. Compared to the nuclear patterns, the pattern reproducibility score for the cytoplasmic patterns evaluated were poor for the discrete dots, the fine speckles and rods and rings, with only the armor pattern being satisfactory in this investigation.
One of the ICAP competent patterns that was, has received a lot of attention is the AC2 pattern characterized by the nuclear dense fine speckle with strong metaphase chromatin staining. This pattern is associated with antibodies to a chromatin associated protein of 50 kilodalton designated DFSC70 with specificity for the length epithelium derived growth factor P75. The presence of monospecific DFSC pattern confirmed by anti DFSC70 antibody has been suggested to exclude the diagnosis of ANA associated connective tissue diseases. However, some reports of the relevance of the DFS70 um, pattern in ruling out ANACTD has been inconsistent, which could be related to the subjectivity in pattern recognition, coexisting autoantibodies, or association of the AC2 pattern with other specificities with relevance for ANA connective tissue disease. In terms of the subjectivity in pattern recognition, it has been reported that there is a high frequency of um, this DFSC, seventh DFSC pattern or AC2 pattern in patients with SLA, um, ensuring that um, confirmatory testing with autoantibodies for the DFSC 70 antibodies is important to help in the disease exclusion. Following observations that certain monospecific patterns are negative for the DFSC70 autoantibodies, confocal microscopy and mean blotting have been used to characterize this DFSC like pattern. While the specificities of the antibodies associated with this pattern are yet to be clearly defined, this observation reinforces the need to confirm the SC2 pattern by the use of DFSC70 antibodies. In addition, laboratories reporting the AC2 pattern must provide the analytical and clinical limitations of this pattern, as well as tests for common autoantibodies associated with homogeneous and speckle patterns. The availability of immunoassays approved for detecting antibodies targeting the DFSC70 antigen is likely to help minimize the subjectivity associated with interpreting this AC2 pattern in routine clinical testing. Another source of variability in the testing of HEP2 IFA has to do with the lack of consensus in screening and estimation of endpoints. To determine the spectrum of laboratory practice in ANA test performance, a CAP survey was performed in 2016 with 628 participants reporting on the screening of HEP2 IFA. Of the participants, about 50% of them reported using a screening titer of 1 to 40, which was closely followed by the 1 to um, 180 screening titer and then um, the 1 to 160 screening titer. Titer was reported to endpoint routinely by 43% of the participants, only upon request by 23% or never by 35% of the participants. Of the participants who responded in this survey, 8% did not report dual patterns. Of those reporting multiple patterns, 23% did not report a titer with each pattern. The lack of uniformity in testing and reporting of HEP2 IFA results may mislead clinicians in their diagnosis and management of patients. The lack of uniformity in testing and reporting HEP2 IFA results may mislead clinicians in their diagnosis and management of their patients. The positive predictive value of most IFA test system is highly dependent on the screening dilution. There is sufficient epidemiological evidence that the best compromise between sensitivity and specificity of the ANA test to be at least 1 to 80. The choice of 1 to 80 has as the best screening dilution is consistent with results obtained by Tan and colleagues on more than 22,000 healthy individuals, showing that this title corresponds to about 95 percentile of healthy controls. While screening at 1 to 10 is commonly performed, certain patterns such as the nuclear fine speckle pattern occur 
at lower titers in healthy individuals than in patients with ANA associated, associated connective tissue diseases. When tested at 1 to 80, most of these patients become negative for ANA at 1 to 80. These studies and others might have in part informed the entry criterion for ANA at a tighter of greater than or equal to 1 to 180 in the 2019 ACR EULA classification criteria for SLA. While much has been described for the screening of patients um, using different ANA methods, particularly the HEP2, very little is known on the impact on disease duration on positivity of ANA testing methods, especially with respect to um, ANA, IFA, and solid phase immune assays, for example, the ELISA method. The impact of ANA positivity between ANA testing methods at disease onset and follow-up has recently been elegantly demonstrated using two IFA kits and an ELISA method. At onset, or at enrollment, all methods show comparable performance characteristics uh, with high titers for IFA or units in the ELISA. However, over five years period, there was a modest variation in the LC performance. Based on these observations, the authors concluded that in clinical situations where SLE diagnosis is being considered, a negative test result by either an ELISA or HEP2 IFA may require reflex testing. This observation may be due to the fact that the ELISAs may have the double-stranded DNA enriched in uh, their formulations. Therefore, as disease um, activity declines, um, the response to the DNA in the ELISAs would also um, decline. One of the other inventions that have really um, taken the laboratory in a positive direction is um, the development of computer-aided diagnostic tools, um, which have shown very comparable performance to the manual um, microscopy or manual uh, method for performing any testing. Um, some of these systems are fully automated and they have the ability to standardize the pre-analytical and the uh, pattern recognition and interpretation, including tighter estimation for HEP2 IFA. These systems arise from the combination of various hardware modules, which using software based on complex mathematical schemes and algorithms can acquire, analyze, and store the images in a fully automated way. Computer-aided diagnoses have been reported to compare well with the manual HEP2 IFA readings, show good differentiations between negative and positive results with greater reproducibility in a study that compared the analytical precision of six computer-aided systems versus the manual IFA method. In the study, the mean coefficient variation was 12% for the computer-aided diagnosis versus 39% for manual IFA. Or over, overall, these systems have the potential to improve workflow, standardize screening dilutions, and improve interlaboratory assessment of HEP2 IFA. The main current challenge for all systems has to do with pattern recognition with technologies being able to override interpretation. In addition, only common nuclear um, patterns are recognized and reported with the current computer-aided diagnosis systems and variabilities in pattern, in pattern specific recognitions as well as tighter estimations have been reported. Computer-aided diagnosis systems provide quantitative expression of fluorescent intensity, allowing the introduction of objective quality control procedures to monitor the test process. However, the calibration of the reading systems and the automated image interpreter are essential prerequisites for obtaining reproducible results. Since fluorescent intensities are strongly dependent on the pattern expression, 
variable concentration and cell distribution of antigens are factors likely to impact recognition and tighter estimation. Therefore, in addition to optimal calibration of reading systems, procedures including cell cultivation and reagents are required for harmonization and standardization across all HEP2 IFA testing. For endpoint estimation, accurate extrapolation of antibody titer based on fluorescent intensity is not possible with only a single screening dilution, and this method cannot be applied to mixed ANA patterns. For the relationship between the fluorescent intensity measure and endpoint titer is system specific and seems to be dependent on the substrate and ANA pattern. On the estimation of endpoint titer and possible risk for setting ANA CTD is likely to be impacted when staining is restricted to specific parts of the cells, for example, as seen in the nuclear dot pattern. Secondly, overlapping antibody patterns can be masked and overlooked if the samples are not analyzed, if the samples are analyzed in only single dilution. There are proposals to use the line slope titration method using at least two distant dilution, for example, 1 to 180 and 1 to 320, to enable better prediction of endpoint titers based on the measured fluorescent intensity and possibly to evaluate um, prozone effects, avoiding serial dilutions. Such processes would require an interfacing middleware between the automated computer-aided diagnostics software and the laboratory information system. That said, some of these proposals have not been validated and incorporated for routine use to be widely adopted and need largely be dependent on specific um, computer-aided diagnostic um, systems. In addition to testing and optimal um, interpretation of results, um, reporting and communication of HEP2 IFA results is very important such that clinicians can use this information in a matter that is timely for the evaluation of their patients. However, there are no standards for reporting HEP2 IFA patterns and titers. Few organizations and expert committees, such as the ICAP and um, the EZ, as well as the EFLM in Europe, have proposed um, certain guidelines for um, reporting of um, ANA titers and patterns. These recommendations include reporting the type of HEP2 substrate, the test method, screening titer, and secondary antibodies used. In addition, the report should include whether the result is positive for specific nuclear, cytoplasmic, or mitotic patterns. The detectable and reportable pattern should be titered to, to a defined endpoint with the highest or higher dilution reported or tighter reported first. In addition to these best practices for ANA reporting, it is important that laboratories clearly indicate the limitations of HEP2 IF negative results. For example, since not all patterns are reported by clinical laboratories, it is important to communicate the scope of patterns for which the laboratory has achieved and maintained competencies. Only patterns for which appropriate and documented training and competencies have been achieved should be reported. Examples illustrating the recommendations for reporting ANA titers results are nicely shown here by Damuzio and colleagues in a publication from 2016. The report as per the recommendation should consist of three categories. The type of assay used, the test results, positive, negative, pattern, antibody level, and the recommendation for the clinician. In the proposal one, which is on the left, the cytoplasmic and mitotic patterns are considered positive. While in proposal two, 
only the nuclear pattern is considered positive and the cytoplasmic and mitotic pattern is considered negative. The examples here illustrate alternate possibilities according to the rules in each proposal for reporting ANA test results. If the test result is negative as in A, this is reported as both in both proposal as negative. If only a cytoplasmic stain is observed as in B, the result is reported as ANA positive in proposal one and as ANA negative in proposal two. The items positive and negative are highlighted to emphasize the differences in the proposals. In both proposals, this result is followed by the statement of the cytoplasmic pattern and antibody titer. If a combination of nuclear and cytoplasmic patterns are observed, the result is reported positive in both proposals because of the nuclear staining. In the next couple of slides, I would like to talk a little bit about non ANA IFA methods for screening. Because there are so many diverse methods, I am just going to really focus on the overall performance characteristics of these methods um, for use in the, rec in the common and uh, more rare um, connective tissue diseases which are associated with ANA. Commercially available spas may be composed of herpetous nuclear extracts and or purified or recombinant antigens to improve their performance. Compared to the HEP2 IFA, which can identify a broad array of antigens but lack diagnostic specificity, the use of SPARS to screen for ANA may be limited by the more restrictive um, antigen repertoire and the use of recombinant or purified antigens. Like the SPARS, the HEP2 IFA can now be automated with slide processors and uh, digital image readers and interfacing with the laboratory information system. I mentioned that the SPARS as an alternative for screening ANAs are less subjective. However, the solid phase immunoassays for detecting ANA are not standardized with respect to the types and number of antigens in the screening test. For example, the combination of specific antigens used in a SPA may be dependent on the kit and the characteristics of the antigens used, including the concentrations of the antigens, the type of solid support, and whether or not um, these spies have been calibrated um, for a specific connective tissue disease. For example, we have spies that are optimal for screening patients with SLE, Sjogren's mixed connective tissue diseases, but of limited diagnostic utility in inflammatory uh, myopathies and systemic sclerodema. Um, this slide shows the early formulations of ANA, um, which were used to comparing um, to HEP2 IFA for ANA detection. As you can quickly notice, the different EIAs um, all had purified antigens, but there were some with recombinant antigens and some which were um, spiked with HEP2 cell lysate. Um, there were some that could identify only IgG antibodies that are specific for ANA, while there was another one that could only identify that could identify IgG and IgM. Uh, and so these early ANA assays were very diverse in their antigenic um, um, formulations. And this type of variability still persists today, even with some of the more highly automated um, solid phase assays. As with the IFAs, um, there are some challenges with the non hep 2 IFA screening methods. These include diverse analytical attributes. The relevance of any SPA as a screening tool for an ANA is kit dependent. Each laboratory should identify the appropriate population that may benefit from the use of the SPA in disease evaluation. Compared to 
HEP2 IFA spas have a limited repertoire of antigens and show limited sensitivities for certain connective tissue diseases such as systemic sclerosis and inflammatory myopathies and may miss some patients with SLE. Given the absence of defined and ANA specificities for some autoimmune um, diseases, for example, autoimmune hepatitis, um, the complexity of autoimmune targets in inflammatory myopathies, SPARs are not optimal screening ANAs for these conditions. And so um, with this, the negative results that may be um, derived from some of these um, SPARs cannot be trusted. One of the questions that as a laboratory and we receive all the time from clinicians um, and which every laboratory should have at the back of the mind is whether or not initial screening for ANA by not HEP2 IFA methods can replace the HEP2 IFA without loss of critical information. To address this issue, a number of studies have been, have been taken um, and so I'm going to highlight a few of these studies um, in the next couple of minutes. So I'm going to talk about um, non hep HEP2 methods versus HEP2 IFA methods as first line um, tests, particularly for those diseases that are relatively common and that which most laboratories should have testing for if they use the ANA testing method. So except when a diagnosis of SLE is strongly suspected, the use of non-HEP2 IFA methods with combination of analyte-specific autoantibodies may be used in the diagnosis of Sjogren's disease and mixed connective tissue disease. For these diseases, um, it's been shown that false positive results without HEP2 IFA can occur, particularly when we have the HEP2 extract included. When there is no HEP2 extract, there is low sensitivities and, specific, and good specificities for some diseases, for example, in Sjogren's syndrome when using SPARS as a screening tool. For syndromic panels, for example, as early systemic scleroderma and inflammatory myopathies, we do not really have enough information for the use of SPARS as screening tools, and HEP2 IFAs have been shown to be very um, variable in performance characteristics, and so are certain SPARS for the evaluation of these diseases. Um, the HEP2 IFA is quite useful in the screening of patients with systemic lupus, um, systemic, sclerodema, systemic sclerodema, mixed connective tissue diseases. In these diseases, when there are low positive autoantibodies, the HEP2 IFA patterns may also be useful to confirm the presence of those disease to guide clinical um, confirmation. With respect to cytoplasmic pattern, there are very limited studies um, with respect to its use in connective tissue diseases, um, maybe due to variable um, expression of um, the um, patterns and lack of reporting of cytoplasmic patterns by many laboratories. I want to use this opportunity to talk about the use of um, non-HEP2 IFA methods and HEP2 IFA methods in um, the diagnostic evaluation of the first line connective tissue diseases, which I have identified here to be systemic scleroderma, mixed connective tissue disease, systemic um, uh, and Sjogren syndrome. In the case of SLE and systemic scleroderma, um, HEP2 IFA is thought to be the optimal method for screening of these patients, and low antibodies can be used, um, and HEP2 IFA patterns can also be used to guide confirmation of low antibodies. For Sjogren syndrome, it appears that these spas are more effective 
as screening tools for Sjogren's compared to the HEP2 IFA. While for mixed connective tissue disease, like for systemic scleroderma and SLE, um, the SPA as well as the um, HEP2 IFA has optimal sensitivities. This slide shows the performance characteristic of the RNA methods for the three main RNA CTDs, which I have described here as SLE, systemic scleroderma, and Sjogren syndrome. In this meta-analysis of a significant number of patients with um, connective tissue disease, the HEP2 IFA was shown to be optimal as a screening tool for systemic lupus, um, erythematous and systemic scleroderma, while the Sjogren was kind of equally um, acceptable to screen for um, using the ANA SPARS and the HEP2 IFA. Um, with respect to the SPA and the HEP2 IFA for SLE, there was some kind of a significant difference in the sensitivity of the SLE between the methods as earlier, which confirms um, the more recent study that was done for HEP2 IFA and ELISA. For the um, inflammatory, um, idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, there appears to be a diversity of ANA HEP2 patterns that have been reported in this um, syndrome. And it will appear that there are certain patterns that are predominant in defined clinical subsets. So for example, the cytoplasmic spectacle pattern is mainly associated with the anti-synthesis syndrome with the predominant antibody being the anti jo one antibody, which is widely available using a large number of solid phase amino acids. However, it has limited sensitivity uh, due to the variable frequency of the expression of HEP2 substrate um, in different HEP2 kits. And the cytoplasmic pattern also has limited frequency in patients who may have necrotizing autoimmune myopathies, mainly in the context of the signal recognition um, particle. And it can also be seen in some patients with dermatomyositis and is largely associated with the MDA5 autoantibodies. Um, with respect to the dermatomyositis, it appears as if um, the nuclear fine speckle has high sensitivity for identifying patients with dermatomyositis. And these um, targets may include the MeToo antibodies, the TIF1 gamma, and for the overlap for the core antibodies. Um, finally, for the nuclear pattern, we can see that in patients with the overlap myositis um, with systemic scleroderma, and that is largely associated with the nuclear pattern, of the nucle homogeneous nuclear pattern with association for the PMSCL autoantigen, which is a multi-complex um, target. Unlike for SLE and, and mixed connective tissue disease and systemic scleroderma, where our understanding for HEP2, IFA, and SPA methods in screening has improved over time, the optimal strategy for the use of SPA for screening idiopathic um, myopathies is limited. This may in part be explained by the antigenic complexities um, of the autoantigen associated with these diseases and their unsuitability in mixtures in single well or beads or solid surface um, um, assays. With respect to the HEP2 IFA, the relevance of screening patients at risk for idiopathic inflammatory seems to be dependent on the clinical subsect. Sus for example, um, in the case of dermatomyositis, as I just mentioned, um, the nuclear spine speckle may be very important. Um, one cannot also rule out the competency of the technologies as well as the specific um, um, HEP2 pattern in the identification or screening of patients with um, inflammatory myopathies.
there is analytical evidence that considering both the myositis specific antibody result and its corresponding HEP2 IFT pattern may help to improve the specificity of myositis specific antibody detection by setting solid phase immunosays for the idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. This is particularly true for the line immunoblood, which is widely used for the evaluation of um, myositis. In addition, the monospecific or monopos monopositivity of myositis specific antibodies is an important additional tool to validate analyte specific immunoassays for myositis, even in the context of using immunoprecipitation, this becomes very important because there are overlaps um, in some of the bands that can be visualized by immunoprecipitation. On this slide, I would like to highlight um, the relevance of using testing panels and looking beyond the extractable nuclear antigens um, for connective tissue disease. In part, diagnostic algorithms for testing for ANA-associated autoantibodies may be governed by the HEP2 IFA patterns and availability of robust solid phase immunoassays for confirmation. The ICAP website, the anapatterns.org, has a comprehensive overview of the different ANO patterns, their associated autoantibodies, and availabilities for clinical testing, as well as their clinical associations. This is indeed an excellent resource, which is continuously updated by ICAP, and labs are encouraged to use this to define algorithms based on the tests available in their laboratories. Additional diagnostic strategies for ANA testing may employ approaches based on disease prevalence or overlapping clinical features, as in the first line screening for S early, Sjogren's, and mixed connective tissue disease, which I show here in this cartoon. For this evaluation, the use of HEP2 IFA and or SPA assays may be clinically useful based on the combination of kits used. Um, if positive by SPA or HEP2, then confirmatory testing for double-stranded DNA, SMID, U1 RNP or SMID RNP, row 52, row 60, and SSB would be important. Um, this panel is really important for, most, for almost all labs that are engaged in the practice of ANA testing and should be um, viewed as a first-line testing for connective tissue disease. Unless there is really um, a heightened um, degree of suspicion for systemic sclerodema, then the HEP2 IFA, which is capable of identifying the centromere pattern which may not require confirmatory testing based on the expertise of the technologies um, can be observed with the HEP2 IFA. And based on the pattern, then testing for SCLE70, RNAP, um, U3 RNAP, THTO or U1 RNP can be performed to further identify um, the patient as having systemic scleroderma or to provide some kind of risk stratification um, for patient management. In the context of the inflammatory, um, idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, the choice of autoantibodies can be governed by the clinical suspicion by the physician. In this case, the physician may choose an anti-synthesis profile or a necrotizing myopathy profile, or a dermatomyositis profile, or overlap syndrome profile. In general, from my experience, except for the CNA one that is really strictly um, associated with eye, um, inclusion body myositis, um, the use of a comprehensive approach to test for inflammatory myopathies is generally cost-effective. 
And this testing may benefit from the use of HEP2 IFA to guide the interpretation of the test results as it may be required. Lastly, it is recognized that some patients may have um, interstitial lung disease in the context of connective tissue diseases. In this particular situation, the patients can be stratified based on whether they have systemic sclerodema, the anti-synthesis syndrome, dermatomyositis, overlapping myositis, or rheumatoid arthritis. In this case, specific autoantibodies based on the clinical suspicion can be ordered. However, in the case on, on, on differentiated connective tissue um, disease or pneumonitis in the absence where the connective tissue disease is not fully um, um, evident, a combination of tests as outlined in the, um, the, the, the profile for autoantibodies on this page um, can be utilized for patient management. There exists consistent challenges, which causes variability in IFA results with possible uh, consequences on the sensitivity, reproducibility, uh, or diagnostic potential um, for the lab as well as for the clinician. These can be categorized based on um, the source of the kit, which could be the HEP2 cells, their growth and antigen expression, the physetives that are used, which might impact the antigen expression, the conjugates, um, including the isotype, the source of the um, antibodies, the purification, the dyes, um, the fluoride to protein ratio, and the concentration of the secondary antibodies, all which would impact sensitivity, anti antigen expression, and others. While in the laboratory, we can talk about the analytical processing and decisions that are made in the labs that can impact not just the test performance, but reproducibility between and within um, laboratories, as well as um, diagnostic potentials. Of these, I think the screening dilution and tighter estimations have been discussed. The reporting of patterns I have highlighted, We've also talked about a little bit about the microscope and computer assisted diagnosis. Um, the method selection, which is really out of the scope of this um, discussion because it's generally going to be dependent on the lab and the resources available. And then the reports that the labs really provide to the clinicians and the guidelines or recommendations made are really variables that really have possible consequences on HEP2 IFA testing. Um, looking forward, one would anticipate that with the several, with the different initiatives that have been taken to address the shortcomings of ANA um, for contemporary methods, there should be ongoing dialogues that should include the in vitro diagnostic um, manufacturers, um, to help optimize reagents and harmonize conditions, particularly for cell growth and reagents, uh, such that patients are optimally evaluated, um, for clinical laboratories to really opt the training and competencies to provide strong guidance on test selection and appropriate reporting, and then for, for those that are involved in academia to really focus guidance and research directed on patients with actionable guidance that labs can take to optimize patients testing and for accurate results that can be utilized by clinicians. And then with, in context um, for the regulation, I think there is really efforts should be made for proficiency testing to enable identification of tests with good which have four performance characteristics such that they can be obsoleted and cause less patient harm. And overall, it seems as if uh, we need to put the patient um, in whatever we do in research, um, in education, in training, in compliance and clinical testing at the forefront. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Tebo, for this wonderful presentation. You cover a lot of interesting and important topics in the field of ANA testing. Also, I want to thank to everyone that has submitted their questions for Dr. Tebo. We have a lot of questions, so if your question doesn't get answered, we will get it back to you via email. So, Dr. Tebo, I'm going to go with the first question. Okay. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for being with us. Uh, so, we have this question several times. So, are there any specifications associated with titers cutoff for children? That's a very difficult question. I know that others have looked in these, and uh, there seems to be a consensus that um, the 1 to 180 is optimal for all population, and uh, 1 to 140, whatever is good for the adults will be good for children. Okay. And also, what about titers in the elderly population? That's also so a very good question. I hope I could answer that question. Um, we don't know if there is a tighter that a cutoff that is optimal for aging population. I just think that based on the tighter and the pattern reported, one could predict whether this is something that is real or not, as well as the patient's clinical presentation. I think we should always put the patient at the forefront okay. and not looking beyond I mean, the titles are important, the patterns are important, but we have to really put the patient at the forefront. Um, the reason why the test is being ordered and how it can be interpreted in the patient's um, uh, evaluation and management. Okay, thank you. And now we have some questions about the testing. So are solid phase tests better than IFA? That's a very difficult question to ask. Um, like I mentioned during the talk, I think there is evidence that it depends on the type of solid phase assay and it depends on the patient's clinical um, suspicion or the underlying, the underlying connective tissue disease that is associated with ANA. So, you know, for some diseases, for example, due to the complexity of the antigen, the SPA may not be a good screening um, tool. Um, I give systemic sclerodema as an example, where we know that um, the nuclear pattern has some limitations with the solid phase assays because most of the antigens that are associated with the nuclear pattern are very complex. And um, one would imagine that if one was to develop a SPA assay for that particular antigen, then maybe a dominant antigen is going to be used in the SPA. And we do not also understand what are the critical components for optimal recognition of that complex antigen when we take away the dominant epitope and use on the SPA. So there may, some, there may be some diagnostic limitations particularly with respect to sensitivity in that particular scenario. So we always have to look at the clinical indications or the clinical, the underlying clinical disease that the patient has when we want to order an ANA test. And this is where labs can really help the physicians to direct how testing should be done. You know, for something like SLE, for systemic sclerodema, maybe the IFA is an optimal screening tool. For something like Sjogren's or mixed connective tissue disease, maybe the SPA, uh, because those, an those um, antigens are well defined and we understand the sensitivities of those um, tests when used in um, a solid phase immune assay. So it depends on the disease and the symptoms. Great. Okay. So what do the guidelines say about confirmatory testing? Are there specific solid phase immunoassays named or preferred? That's a very difficult question to respond, particularly as we know that the different um, the different assays and assays have different performance characteristics. 
most guidelines do not really go into the specific assays to recommend for testing. They might just recommend specific analytes. So for example, uh, this ever for the evaluation of systemic sclerodema, um, the ACR ULA classification criteria recommends testing for centromere antibodies, topoisomerase antibodies, and RNA polymerase because those are the best characterized um, immune, um, antibodies for the diagnosis of this patient. And so they just go by the analyte and not by the specific method for detection. I think understanding the method that is used for detection by your laboratory and the analytical or clinical limitations is really important. And some of this can be found in the literature. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a technical question. Can you elaborate on the metaphase staining, please? Um, that is an emerging area. I think, um, you know, the competence of that metaphase staining, it's emerging. Um, we know that there are differences in um, how the truly DFS the FSC 70 um, pattern looks like. Um, and then there is also the emerging um, view of the DFSC 70 pattern that may not be associated with the, um, I rephrase that. So we have, there is an emerging view that we may have two types of DFSC 70 pattern um, or the AC2 pattern, the one for which we have a confirmatory antibody which can really confirm that pattern which is associated with um for the exclusion of ANA con associated connective tissue disease and then there's one other one which is emerging which um it's a variant of the, what we know as AC2 which may not be associated with the exclusion of um, um, ANA associated CTD and that particular pattern is only emerging and I think we will know more um, with time. We do not have any confirmatory autoantibodies that are associated with that other pattern and so I, I don't really want to talk much about that because I really do not at this time understand um, the true clinical features of that pattern, which is not associated with the, for the exclusion of ANA CTD. I hope that helps. Yeah, I guess we need to wait for more studies to- yeah, Yes, I think so. Yeah, okay, great. So I think labs which want to report that, um, they would have to validate the confirmatory testing and see how that performs based on their experience mm -hmm. and really to uh, communicate some of the limitations that we now know of that pattern in the context of excluding, you know, ANA CTD. I think I think that will be best practice. So now we have another question. I think we can link to this one. How to differentiate the FS70 versus pseudo the FS pattern? Pseudo the FS must put in the result. Do we? I guess the labs do need to report pseudo patterns. So at this time, I think um, based on my limited knowledge <laughs> of that, of, of, of the DFSC 70 pattern, I, I would think that if you report the DFSC 70 pattern and you do not confirm the testing, um, one could say, okay, we, this is a pattern that is observed. Um, it may be or may not be associated with in a CTD, um, strong clinical correlation is indicated, and then maybe testing for spe common speckles um, associated O2 antibodies would be um, suggested, just such that those diseases can be ruled out, especially in the absence of the DFSC70 O2 antibody. If the DFSC70 O2 antibody is available, then confirmatory testing can be performed. And if it is positive and there are no other ANA associated patterns, then we can in our report indicate that there is a likelihood that um, the patient may not 
um, have an ANA associated connective tissue disease, but clinical correlation should be um, um, recommended. Because we never know in the lab, we don't have the full picture and always mm -hmm. having that disclaimer, I think is something which is really important. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you please elaborate yeah. on why are cytoplasmic results less good than nuclear results? Um, that's a very challenging question. I wish I knew, um, but I, I hope I can speculate here. Uh, it, 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 you know, when you have the growth of a cell, right, you have different phases of the growth path and right. And so one can imagine that maybe um, what we have in the lab for the growth for the HEP2 cells have been focused on the nuclear pattern. And maybe we should start looking at what is the optimal conditions for growing HEP2 cells such that all patterns are optimally expressed. That is that is maybe one thought. And it could just be that that's an inherent limitation of the HEP2 IFA. So two things here. Um, do we have the optimal conditions to um, grow cells such that all the patterns that are associated with what we now define as HEP2 positive are expressed. So that would be the cytoplasmic patterns, the HEP2 patterns, uh, the nuclear patterns, and the mitotic patterns. On the other hand, you know, is that a limitation of the HEP2 substrate that, you know what, whatever we do, it's just going to be like that until we do those experiments or we define those conditions and uh, look at the different substrates in terms of the media requirements, the growth requirements and, you know, more other things, we will not know. So I think this is where manufacturers should really come together and try to define the conditions that are appropriate for growth of the cells and to define whether or not we need HEP2 cells for cytoplasmic staining or HEP2 cells that are grown differently for nuclear staining versus HEP cytoplasmic staining. Um, I think it's worth looking at. Maybe that's a limitation, but if we don't do those things, those studies, we would never know. Great, thank you. Okay. Should mixed patterns have titers reported individually or per pattern? I don't understand the question. If you have a mixed pattern, then you have to report the patterns individually. Mm -hmm. And um, like I mentioned in the talk, um, you report the higher title first and then or the highest title first and then you you know, it's good to report them differently and based on the titles, the endpoint titles for the different patterns. Mm -hmm. I think that's best practice. There's really no guidance. No one knows the right answer, but I think as per experts, that's, that, that would be a best practice for the lab. If you see homogeneous pattern, you report the homogeneous pattern, the speckle pattern, and the cytoplasmic pattern, whatever the case may be, differently, just mm -hmm. such that the physician sees the report and understands in the context of the patient what those patterns may mean. Okay, great, thank you. And this is more technical question. Can you explain the prozone effect? I mean, the prozone effect generally, what does that mean? It means that maybe at the screening dilution, you report a positive report as negative, right? And it all it's all dependent on how assays are set up. Traditionally, um, based on my experience, um, when we screen for any IFA using the manual platform, most labs do not screen at one title. They screen at maybe one or two or two or three titles. For example, if labs were screening at one to one forty, they will screen the patient at one to one forty, one to one eighty, and one to one sixty, just such that um, if there was a prozone at one to one forty, that can be identified at one to one eighty or one to one sixty. Um, when we now have single well um, titer, 
irrespective of whether you're using an automated platform or a manual platform, you're bound to have a frozen effect. And I think it's dependent on labs to determine what is their optimal standard starting dilution for any of the ANAs that they use and how is that if you're going to use a single dilution, how does that impact the prozone effect? So um, I think it all depends on the experience and how those screening is done in any particular laboratory. And Dr. Tebo, I have a follow-up question. Do, do the guidelines say anything about this? About I don't think there is any um guidelines that is universally accepted um these are coming from recommendations there's an excellent article from the easy um icap and others that was uh, recently um published in 2023 i think that's a good resource i haven't really looked into that article fully uh, but I think labs should really go back to that article because I think it has a lot of pearls um, for laboratories to use um, for the ANA associated test and also the ANA. Um, I think it's going to be a good resource for labs. I really um, do not want to make a general comment because I use a specific kit and my experience may be limited to that kit. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, and this is re uh, specific for Mayo Clinic. This person from the audience say, I understand that Mayo performs ANA IFA on CSF samples too. Can you please share more on the clinical application of ANA testing on CSF? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think um, my lab has um does testing for um csf i would like to see that i and I, I know we don't perform that routinely for clinical use um the optimal specimen that is recommended is the serum um so i can't really comment on that okay thank you okay so uh, this is about the uh, different types of autoimmune diseases. What about ANA positivity and neurologic autoimmune diseases such as autoimmune encephalitis? Have you seen these cases? There are reports about ANA in some autoimmune um, neurologic um, diseases, um, which could be associated with um, some in the CTDs like Sjogren's. Um, but however, routine um, testing for ANA in um, neuroencephalitis or neuroimmune encephalitis, I mean, we don't have a complete picture. I think there may be cases or um, um, reports here and there, but for a comprehensive overview of ANA testing in those conditions, I think the data is very limited, um, you know. <laughs> so I, 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 I think we don't have a comprehensive understanding of, of that okay. in neurological diseases. And there are publications, so we will learn more in the yeah, coming years. I, I think so. One would have to look at maybe a good uh, cohort and <laughs> well-defined um, cases or patients with encephalitis to have a good appreciation of um, the in the prevalence and the types of you know patterns that are seen in in, in that population. Um, I, I think um, in the context of ANCTD, in the context of um, autoimmune liver diseases, we have an appreciation. But in those other diseases, you know, um, I think we do not have a comprehensive understanding to recommend the use of ANA testing in those uh, in, in those disorders. Okay, great. Thank you. And speaking about autoimmune liver diseases, there was a question: What should be pediatric samples? sample dilution for asthma and LKM testing as per the guidelines? 
again you know what the guidelines say they just provide different titles and the positive predictive value or um, the risk estimation for either autoimmune hepatitis in this patient. So for example, at 1 to 1, 20 to 1 to 140, um, they, they, they have some um, frequencies of the risk um, for um, those um, autoimmune hepatitis. But I think to provide generally a tighter sometimes can be misleading because these assays can be very subjective and the positive predictive value may be very dependent on the experience of the lab and how those assays are set up in those labs. Um, I think for something like LKM, we have ELISAs that could be um, preferable for, for testing, or if you have an LKM results by an IFA, you want to confirm by an ELISA such that if you have positivity in two compartments, the risk for disease is mm -hmm. higher than when you have LKM positive by either ELISA or the IFA. So I think because those diseases are very rare, having a very good um, understanding of the performance of kids, it's, you know, um, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> okay, great. So the next question is, given that providers may not be experienced or trained to recognize Sawyer syndrome versus other rheumatic diseases on clinical basis, would you recommend a screening by ANA-IFA with reflex of negative ANA-IFA to uh, SPA or for SSA? Can you repeat the question again? I didn't get that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, as uh, providers are not experienced or trained to recognize Sojourn syndrome versus other rheumatic diseases, so to differentiate it, would you recommend a screening by ANA IFA? And if it's negative, reflex to a SPA for SSA. Yes, I think so. I think there is sufficient evidence in the literature that um, the IFA is not very sensitive um, in um, for Sjogren's disease and the use of specific um, autoantibodies such as the SSA 52, uh, row 52, row 60 and SSB, it's important. And the addition, it would appear that if we test for these analytes separately, you know, SS, row 52, row 60, and SSB, there is not just the diagnostic utility in, in the positivity of those assays, they may also help to define um, increased risk for disease and even disease burden that is help in, you know, understanding phenotypic characteristics of patients with Sjogren. So that is correct. If the mm -hmm. HEP2 IFA is negative and the, the suspicion for Sjogren, it is okay to test for row 52, row 60, and um, um, SSB LA autoantibodies. Okay, great, thank you. Also, there was one question about the ICAP guidelines. How do you think about ICAP suggesting laboratory use call name anti-cell instead of ANA? You know, we all endorse that. Um, I think it will take some time for it to pick up uh, because, you know, once we start using a num like the anti-nuclear antibodies, which has been with us for a very long time, it's difficult to change. Um, I can foresee some labs incorporating that in their test menu or in their test directory or even in their result in reporting of patient results. Um, but you know what, I think it's going to take time for it to really pick up because that would be the right thing to do because those antibodies are really, these anticellular, these cytoplasmic antibodies are really important. And, um, you know, um, we're using that sometimes in our lab. Um, in Mayo Clinic, in a test laboratory directory, we've introduced the concept mm -hmm. of anticellular antibodies. And uh, I know there are other labs that have also use that nomenclature, but I think it's going to take time for that nomenclature to really pick up. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think it's the direction of the future. To, go, to but, cover both, yeah. Yeah, but we don't know what that future is. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Thank you. And we have time for one last question. We have a lot of questions, Dr. Tebo. So the remaining questions we will will be addressed via email. So okay. this question is what antibodies are recommended in ANA PSC? PSC, how to interpret them in the case of unclear clinical symptoms. So it's ANA positivity and primary sclerosis in cholangitis. Oh, we, you know, that's a good question. I don't think there's a defined ANA per se for PSC. Um, I, I am not familiar with that and, and so I can't comment. Um, I know that in the context of autoimmune hepatitis and primary biliary cholangitis, you have specific patterns that are associated with, for example, primary biliary cholangitis. If there is an overlap between PSC and maybe autoimmune hepatitis or primary biliary cholangitis, then you can have an ANA. So um, just with respect to PSC, I don't, I don't know. But in the context of an overlap, then one can begin to think about what is the overlap disease and what is the ANA that can be positive. In this case, is it AMA? You know, is it um, is it um, the nuclear dots? Is it um, the envelope? You know, so one has to look at the underlying um, the spectrum of, of of the disease, right? So. Mm -hmm. I think that's all. I I don't know, and it may be something I should look into. But for now, the only response I can think about is in the context of maybe an overlap autoimmune liver disease, such as primary biliary cholangitis or mm -hmm. autoimmune hepatitis. Okay, great. So thank you once again, yeah. Dr. Tevo. It was a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank all you. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. On December 7th, we will be hosting a webinar on infectious diseases, specifically about cytomegalovirus infection. So we hope we will see you there again. Thank you so much and bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.